As the Money Burns is an original podcast by Nikki Wooder. Based on historical research, this is a deep exploration into what happened to a set of actual heirs and heiresses to some of America's most famous fortunes when the Great Depression hits. Each episode has three primary sections. Section 1 is a narrative story. Section 2 goes deeper into the historical facts. Section 3 focuses on contemporary, emotional, and personal connections. Story Recap Richest boy, Huntington Hartford, secretly elopes, while Princess Alexis Devani and Louise Van Allen have a small, intimate wedding. After her Buckingham Palace debut, Barbara Hutton mingles with the Prince of Wales. Now back to As the Money Burns, odds on favorite. Stakes are high in various sports and competitions, but the highest stakes come in the game of marriage. Rivals beware. Section 1, Story Another glorious summer has arrived. Maybe the tides have changed and everything will continue to get better. Oh, who's kidding? We, the audience, know it's the Great Depression with several more years to go. Nevertheless, nothing better distracts the elites and masses than rounds of endless activities especially sports competitions. But everyone knows it is during the summer festivities that marital arrangements are made. And in that realm, everyone buys for the best trophy wife or husband. However, a spouse, unlike a trophy, is the beginning and not the end of a much larger game. Speculators, gamblers, or in British colloquial terms, plungers, might have a lot to bet on with these upcoming matches. Friday, June 5th, 1931. Young tennis sensation and movie star handsome Frank Shields gets temporary relief from his dull junior bank loan officer desk job to join the international circuit for the Davis Cup. He made a smashing success against Mexico, Canada, and Argentina and is now on the Ile-de-France ocean liner heading to London for Wimbledon before continuing the Davis Cup challenges in France. This year for the Davis Cup, America has its youngest team ever. 20-year-old Frank is joined by 19-year-old Sidney Wood of New York and student at the University of Arizona. Clifford Sutter of New Orleans beat Argentina but didn't make the cut abroad. Instead, 25-year-olds George Lott and Johnny Van Ryn, both already in France, will round out the team for the European Tour and against Japan. The former American champion, Big Bill Tilden, was born into wealth but recently found himself in need of money, turning pro on December 31, 1930, and thus unable to participate on the amateur teams. Earlier that previous year in August at Southampton, Frank did the near impossible and beat the long-reigning champion, Tilden. Perhaps Tilden wisely chose to cash in while still viable. Accompanying Sydney and Frank across the Atlantic Ocean, Frank's fiance Billy Tenney, travels with a chaperone as deemed socially appropriate and necessary. A scrupulous move, as Frank has been a bit mischievous in the past at least once, if not more, having been while on a tour a house guest caught under the bed of a different patron's daughter. Their chaperone is none other than Frank's most enduring patroness, Maud Barger Wallach a Newport Society maven and a former tennis star herself who began her career at age 30 and continues to play. She turned 61 on the day of their arrival in London, June 15th, a perfectly delightful way for her to spend her birthday amongst the young U.S. Davis Cup team members. They will spend a week preparing for upcoming Wimbledon, which starts later this month, after which they continue back on the Davis Cup circuit. Tuesday, June 16th, 1931. Meanwhile, also in London, the Royal Ascot races begin with various stakes and prizes, especially the highly desirable Ascot Gold Cup. The opening parade sees the Prince of Wales and Duke of York ride in an open carriage facing their parents, King George V and Queen Mary. The royal caravans originate from Windsor Castle. In rank, the rest of the family members follow in separate carriages, including Princess Mary, Prince George, and the Duchess of York. News of this year's Ascot include the new giant electric totalisator, which is essentially a large betting control board for the horse races. 
The Royal Ascot is a must-not-miss four-day event that previous Buckingham Palace presentations so covetly guarantees admission. The still-eligible Bachelor Prince of Wales joins a number of friends at Belvedere. Alas, hopeful and unaware debutantes might have their dreams dashed, as the prince's current and future married mistresses, Lady Thelma Morgan Furness and Wallace Simpson, are likely mingling within his entourage. However, the Prince of Wales will not be the only one to disappoint marriage-minded debutantes this season. The word is out as reported by Charlie Knickerbocker that another Newport season will be absent of socialite Henrietta Hartford. Is it possible the smothering mother is merely trying to fend off debutantes sneaking to ensnare her son, richest boy, babyface Huntington Hartford? Henrietta achieves the near impossible by charming Charlie to her side and he is her biggest supporter. Supreme Gossip and Society reporter Charlie relays that it is a brilliant social chess move as the widow Hartford is seemingly uninterested in following society's rigid protocols to be seen in select places. She follows her last year precedent when she ventured to Europe instead and this year goes westward to eventually land in Honolulu. Of course, Henrietta and Hartford are expected to return in time for the Newport tennis tournaments and yacht races. Such a simple explanation and an obvious falsehood. Those in the know are well aware that Henrietta ventured to Europe to hide from Huntington's cheating scandal, resulting in his exclusion from graduation activities at St. Paul's. This year, she tries to cover another unfortunate and scandalous truth that is likely to derail all of the mother's hopes for her son's future. Back in April, Huntington eloped with the West Virginia dentist's daughter, Mary Lee Epling, studying to be a kindergarten teacher at Leslie College in Boston, nearby to Huntington's Harvard. Weeks later, when the couple announces their marriage to their families, hysterically, Henrietta falls to the floor and lays there wailing and crying in dismay. The overly devoted mother had plans for Huntington to marry their Newport neighbor, richest girl Doors Duke, or if not her, then another wealthy or prominent socialite. By the way, Mary Lee's parents are equally upset, though less demonstrative, over the marriage and collude with Henrietta to keep the marriage secret. Huntington remains at his dorm room in the Winthrop house, while Mary Lee stays in her independent accommodations with her college roommates. When both schools break for the summer and before the secret gets out, Henrietta takes the newlyweds on a trip through the Canadian Rockies and on to Hawaii in hopes of convincing both, or at least one of them, to consent to an annulment. She continuously pleads with the naive and idealistic couple. Separately, Mary Lee Epling and Henrietta with Huntington Hartford board the ocean liner Malola of the Matson Line and head off to Hawaii. Fingers crossed, Henrietta will break their resistance before summer's end. Speaking of forbidden loves, Barbara Hutton's desperate attempts to reunite thwarted lovers in the hope that true love conquers all has failed as both move on to more suitable partners. Barbara, already nearby, will likely witness, in Paris, the most prominent wedding of the season on Thursday, June 18, 1931. Inside the chapel of St. Louis des Invalides, the Bella Paris, Silvia Rodriguez de Rivas de Castilla de Guzman and the sophisticated Cantonry de Castellan, son of Stanislas de Castellan, who serves as vice president of the Chamber of Deputies in France. Carrying a white bouquet, Sylvia is dressed in a bridal gown with simple lines by famed designer Patou. The simplicity and elegance of her decor enhances and highlights her stunning beauty. The groom himself is quite a catch, a Harvard graduate and coming from a prominent French noble family. A far better prospect in the eyes of Sylvia's family than her former poor, disenfranchised prince. Her father, the Count de Castilla de Guzman, is close friend and supporter of King Alfonso XIII, who recently fled Spain to avoid a civil war. Sylvia's family has been struggling financially since the crash, and the recent turmoil in Spain has not given them much hope. Sylvia had a heavy, off-and-on romantic relationship with Prince Alexis Divani, intermingled with his courtship of his now recently acquired wife, American heiress Louise Van Allen. While Prince Alexis and Louise honeymoon in Europe with plans to settle later potentially in Paris, the newlywed couple Sylvia and Henri intend to visit America this upcoming fall. So many have entered or entering into the marital game. 
Marriage is always a plunge, so to speak. But who has placed the best long-term bet on their choice of mate? All is never as simple as it seems when playing the game of love, marriage, and fortune. Section 2. History and Historiography Summer comes with plenty of activities and lots of competition in various fields of sport. Golf, boxing, tennis, swimming, racing, travel, and ever and always courtship and love. There are so many things happening in 1931, so we will focus on those most relevant to our characters and current plots over the next few episodes. The international men's tennis event, the Davis Cup, began in 1900 between Great Britain and the United States and has expanded to over 135 nations by 2016. The women's equivalent is founded in 1963 and originally called the Federation Cup or Fed Cup and now, as of 2020, named the Billie Jean King Cup. The concept of the Davis Cup was created by James Dwight, considered the founding father of American tennis, when he wanted to get an estimate of British versus American ability at lawn tennis. James Dwight attempted multiple times to no avail for almost two decades, when a Harvard student, Dwight Davis, approached him again in 1899 to set up an international competition and commissioned a sterling silver bowl trophy. During the first set of competitions in 1900, Dwight Davis serves as captain of the American team, which won its first three matches against Britain. The tournament is originally called the International Lawn Tennis Challenge, but in time would be referred by the trophy and hence the Davis Cup. Initially, all teams played each other in challenge rounds to play in a battle for the final match against the previous year's winner. As more nations joined by 1972, it became a knockout tournament from start to finish. For 2022, Russia and Belarus are banned from participating due to the invasion of Ukraine. As for the Royal Ascot, the four-day, multi-event horse race is considered to be the centerpiece of the British summer social calendar. The 300-year-old race course was founded by Queen Anne in 1711, and the four-day race, known as the Royal Ascot, is founded in 1768. In remembrance of her, the Queen Anne Stakes is the opening race with crossing straight over the finish line. Of course, there are multiple stakes attributed to various royal family members, including the Prince of Wales and today the Duke of Cambridge Stakes. The modern events took more recognizable shape in 1806 with the incorporation of the Gold Cup races. The Gold Cup is held on the third day, which is also considered Ladies' Day, when the most fashionable try to make their mark at that year's event. Strict dress codes apply, as ladies must always have a hat or fascinator and men in suits. Different restricted areas elevate the style of dress as in men wear either jackets, full-length suit, or full morning dress with top hat. For 1931, there's an attempt to forego the use of top hat. As with the garden parties, fashion trends amongst women are bright colors, especially green, black gloves, and wide-brimmed hats. Around the world, others will mimic the events to join in the fun, like those in Hollywood hosting their own Royal Ascot garden parties. Who's to say if they too mimic the rained-out activities that year? As begun by King George IV in 1825, the opening ceremony at 2 p.m. involves the royal family parading in with the playing of the national anthem and raising the national standard. There is a 1931 British Pathé film featuring the opening procession with King George V and Queen Mary. A link is available via the notes section, social media, and the website asthemoneyburns.com. For 1931, a new building is erected, the Total Lasator, which is used to facilitate bets. Another reference in the news coverage refers to the totes as being exceptional this particular year. Ah, uh, yes, gambling and speculating must always accompany sports, and this is a more acceptable manner. Prize winners aren't the only ones who might win or gain some cash. Like any big specialty races, select horses also gain celebrity status. In 1931, the horses Hornet's Beauty, Parenthesis, Irish Elegance, Cameroon, and Trimdom gets several mentions. The father of Ali Khan, Aga Khan III, sponsors a couple of horse teams from France, though is not so lucky this year. 
as also referenced in the press. I could go into more details of the romances and relationships, but as we are discussing marriages, those stories will be explored in far more depth throughout the series. Let's just say the gaming activities involving days or weeks-long tennis matches or betting on horses have a far more concise and conclusive result with a heck of a lot better odds than any relationships when fortunes are involved. The odds on favorite in the beginning might not be the same in the end. Section 3, Contemporary and Personal Relevance So what is more alluring in the game of love? A beautiful wife, a handsome husband, charming, artistic, creative, athletic, rich, intellectual, a good dancer, an adventurer, bedroom skills? What causes love to grow even hotter? Is a secret love affair better than a publicly celebrated relationship? Does steamy hot love always fizzle out and grow cold? Have you ever had your ideal romantic partner? How did it begin? Did it end, or is it still going? The inspiration behind these stories and how it can go horribly wrong is the spark that got me hooked on needing to tell them. Parallels with my own experiences and failures in the pursuit of love. My two most influential experiences pre-creating the series, a sweet high school romance while at a summer intensive program at Brown University, and my later marriage. Both with foreigners from the same country, actually, though couldn't be more far apart in personalities and life goals. The first had sweet moments of romance that felt a little like the beginning of Pretty in Pink, a computer hacker sending secret admirer messages. The latter romance a decade later in what felt like my perfect match in so many ways, beginning with our finally breaking the ice when I learned his nationality and uttered a sentence in his native language, Turkish. Well, the first didn't survive the long distance apart after the summer's end and a life tragedy that occurred shortly after. The other lasted nearly 10 years, ending in total disaster. Who is your odds-on favorite in the game of love and fortune within our tales? Come join us at any social media outlet for your input. Just remember, no matter how many bets you place, in the end, the house always wins. Let's not overlook a major historical moment occurring this week, which has been recently mentioned in and relevant to previous episodes. By the end of this upcoming weekend, June 11th and 12th, Queen Elizabeth II will become the second longest reigning monarch in history. Only King Louis XIV of France reigned longer and with verifiable dates at over 72 years. In celebration of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee on June 2nd, coinciding with the Trooping the Color Balcony Ceremony, Earbud's Collective Newsletter posted a blog listing royal and royalty-related podcast episodes curated by yours truly. Selected episodes involve modern royals as well as those from past and from all over the world. Check out www.earbudspodcastcollective.org for more curated themed lists if you're wanting to find more podcasts. In addition, I had a call-in interview with local Houston radio talk show host Michael Berry discussing As the Money Burns and independent podcasting. He has kindly featured my interview twice on his show and podcast in the prime evening spots, Wednesday, May 25th, Rubberneck reporting around 21 minutes and 30 seconds to 36 minutes and 30 seconds, and Friday, June 3rd, We Need a Crisis around 22 minutes and 4 seconds to 37 minutes and 20 seconds. He can be located via iHeartRadio app and website, as well as www.michaelberrybrryshow.com. Lastly, this spring, I participated in the OSA Collective First Ever Female Podcaster Bootcamp, and in conjunction with them, As the Money Burns will be featured on Monday, June 27th on Good Pods, a podcast app that helps create a community to connect listeners and podcasts with recommendations, ratings, reviews, groups, and other features. Good Pods can be downloaded from Apple, Google, and other app stores. All links to the above will be available on all social media and the website related to As the Money Burns in the events and press section. Next, when we return to As the Money Burns, 
Plenty of antics occur both on and off the court at the world's oldest and most prestigious tennis tournament, Wimbledon. Will the queen be amused, or will she declare off with their heads? Until then. As the Money Burns is an original podcast written, produced, and voiced by Nikki Woodard based on historical research. Archival music has been provided by Past Perfect Vintage Music. Check out their website at www.pastperfect.com. Please come visit us at As The Money Burns via Good Pods, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Transcripts, timeline, episode guide, and character bios are available at asthemoneyburns.com.